Good evening and welcome to the April 16th council meeting. We have a very special group that's going to lead us in the flag the salute this evening. I'd like to call up Troop 205 along with Cubmaster Megan Busser. And if you'd all please stand. Thank you. I'm going to have Mr. Andrew Franco go ahead and lead us in the pledge. All in uniform, please salute. All others, place your right hand over your heart and follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council members, for having us today. We are part of PAC 205 here in Chino. We meet on Tuesday nights at 6.50 at Cross Point. If anyone is interested in joining us, we'd love to meet you. And thank you, Scouts. We brought a Scout from every rank we have right now and even our girls' den. We are a family pack, so we have girls' and boys' dens. You may be seated. Let's give them a hand. Okay, this next presentation is very special. Um, I'd like to call up John Anderson, Christian Lee, and Patricia Cox. I'd also like to invite your families up with you. Family members you want to bring up? Come on up. Family can come up. Phyllis, do you want to come up with John? Yes. Okay, tonight we're here to celebrate three very special people who have dedicated their lives to scouting and furthering the noble goals of the Boy Scouts of America. Mr. Christian Lee has served as Troop 201 Scoutmaster from 2005 to December 31st, 2023, selflessly leading Troop 201 and enriching the lives of countless children across the Chino Valley. Mrs. Patricia Cox served as the Troop's committee chair from 2010 until just this last December. In her role, Patricia ensured troop activities ran smoothly and efficiently. And that's not easy, right? Right. (laughs) And finally, last but certainly not least, we're here to honor Mr. John Anderson. John is the oldest living Eagle Scout, having achieved the rank in 1952. Since then, he has devoted his time and expertise to the organization that molded him into the person he is today serving most recently as the troop's treasurer. To our honorees, please know that your hard work, selflessness, and dedication to our youth are the epitome of what makes Chino such a special community. On behalf of the Chino City Council, I'd like to present you all with a special token of congratulations on your unwavering service to Troop 201 and making a lasting impact in the lives of countless scouts. Patricia? Mr. Lee, and John, we actually have two tokens for you. We have, have I got this? I've got the bag. Phyllis, would you like to hold, or John? And then, John, for all of your year's dedication, we thought it would only be appropriate to present you with the Chinoopoly game. (laughs) So... Uh, it's it's been an honor helping and watching uh, scouts they start so small and and get grow up and all the things that they learn and and take on it's it's truly great and that's why I don't mind helping because you see the growth and 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 with helping them 
grew up to be wonderful adults. They do. Thank you, Patricia. Oh, it's been a blessing to be able to be involved with Troop 201. I've had great role models like Mr. Anderson to uh, help inspire me all these many years. It's been a really wonderful experience. And John? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll, well, I'll have to speak real close because his voice is not too strong. But anyway, I appreciate the honor of being here to celebrate our 80 years of Boy Scouting in Chino. And the family has been here since 80, 1884. And we're still going. <laughs> Let's give them a wonderful hand. to get a picture. <laughs> These people have dedicated their lives to helping young men and women grow up to be strong, productive adults. I want to thank you so much from the bottom of all of our hearts. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, thank you John. Next, we have a proclamation for National Public Safety Telecommunication Week. Oh, my goodness. Telecommunications Week. I'd like to call up Police Chief Kevin Menson, Chino Police Department Dispatchers Brenda Ortiz, Fernando Peleas, Samantha Simone, Jaden Aguilar, uh, Siri Neverez, and Jen Bass. And the proclamation reads, whereas emergencies can strike at any time, and when they do, we rely on the vigilance and preparedness of professional public safety dispatchers. P professional public safety dispatchers are the first and most critical contact our citizens have with emergency services and serve as that vital link between the citizen and the first responder who may apprehend a criminal, save their possessions from fire, and save their life or the life of a loved one. The safety and effectiveness of our officers and firefighters is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information provided by the dispatcher. The professional dispatchers of Chino Police Department answered approximately 130,000 calls in 2023, exhibiting compassion, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their job and contributing substantially to the high-quality public safety services provided by the Chino Police Department. The United States Congress has designated the second full week of April as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week in order to, in order the, to honor these men and women and their critical role in the protecting life and property. The city of Chino proudly recognizes these dedicated professionals and commend them for the past 31 years of service as well as their continued commitment to providing quality caring service to the Chino community. Now, therefore, I, Eunice Emilua, mayor of the city of Chino, in honor of the men and women whose diligence and professionalism keep our city and citizens safe, do hereby proclaim 31 years of quality community service from Chino's public safety dispatchers and recognize April 14th to the 20th, 2024, as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mayor, for this proclamation. Let's give us to me. Here we go. So... I want to thank you all for your, for your hard work and dedication. Being a public safety dispatcher is a very, very challenging job. It is the ultimate of having to multitask, do multiple things all at one time. And the 130,000 calls, that's over 350 calls a day that they answer. And so we've worked really hard in the city in combating crime and using our real-time crime center and our LPRs, our intersection cameras but our real-time crime center is actually only staffed for about 80 hours out of the week. During those other times, it is these dispatchers that are using that technology to solve crime. And this group up here has solved just countless crimes that have taken place using the, the tools and the resources that, that they have available to them. So I really thank you for their, for their hard work and their dedication to the safety of our community. Yes, yeah, so this is Monique. This is 
our, our supervisor, Brenda, Samantha, who is one of our newest dispatchers, who's, and Jessica, Asiri, another one of our new dispatchers, Cindy, who is another new dispatcher. So we have three dispatchers in training that are here right now, a dispatch supervisor, Jeanette, and Fernando. And I know over half of them came in today on their day off just to come to this council meeting. So thank you once again for your dedication. Thank you again for all your hard work. City Manager Reich, do we have any agenda additions or, excuse me, revisions? Mayor, I'd like to pull number 16 and send it back to staff, please. Okay. Okay. Within our pack this evening is uh, our economic development report and our external agency report. I do encourage all of you to access this information online. Uh, it has some very valuable information in it. Next, under public communications, under a Community Earth Day event, first, the Inland Empire Utilities Agency and the City of Chino are holding a free Community Earth Day event on Thursday, April 18th, from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., located at the Chino Creek Wetlands and Education Park at 6075 Kimball Avenue. All participants will be able to enjoy a tour of the park along with educational activities, environmental exhibits, animal encounters, giveaways, and more. For more information, please contact 909-334-3282. As a reminder, please make sure to join us for the 22nd Annual Corn Feed Run Car Show and Cruise on Saturday, April 27th at City Hall from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Hosted by the Chino Kiwanis Club, the event showcases classic cars in the downtown, live DJ music, and local vendor booths. A must attend for car enthusiasts. For more information, please visit www.chinokiwanis.com. We also ask you to join us for Bike Day on Saturday, May 11th, from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. at Ruben S. Hyala Park in Chino. Start the day with a community bike ride at 7.45 a.m. and enjoy helmet giveaways, bike registration, repairs, an obstacle course, and kids' activities. This family-friendly event, presented by Healthy Chino and the Chino Police Department, promises fun for all ages with a special family bike day or bike ride. Don't miss out on this exciting opportunity to celebrate cycling with the community. For more details, please visit cityofchino.org forward slash bike day. And for the State of the City 2024, as mayor, I'm thrilled to invite you to our State of the City address from Heritage to Horizon on Tuesday, May 14th at Chafee College Community Center. This event, organized by the Chino Valley Chamber of Commerce, will highlight our city's achievements and future plans. Join us for an insightful evening as we explore Chino's heritage and horizon together. For ticket information and RSVP details, please visit cityofchino.org forward slash SOTC. Next on the agenda is public communication. This is the time and the place for the general public to address the council on items that are not elsewhere on the agenda. Our first written request to speak is an invocation from Pastor Roy Robbins from the Christ Lutheran Church. I ask all of you who would like to join us to please stand. 
Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. It's always a pleasure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening asking for your guidance and wisdom as this meeting begins. It's been a long day for all those in attendance, and so we ask for patience and a spirit of charity this evening. Thank you for the leadership represented here in these chambers, but also for those who tend to the business of the city each and every day who are behind the scenes. Fill us with compassion and insight as de decisions are made that affect our city and the surrounding communities. Help us to always have a keen eye for the least of these, and may our compassion spur us to action. Remind us that all that is accomplished here this evening is for your glory and for the service of our community and beyond. Father, your grace and mercy sustain us always. Let the past remind us that you never fail. May thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you again. Thank you, Pastor Roy. next request to speak is Melissa Campani from Supervisor Kurt Hagman's office. Well, good evening, Mayor, Council members, staff, and of course, community members. My name is Melissa, and I am here representing your County Supervisor Kurt Hagman. And Supervisor Hagman uh, has a very special event coming up today, and we just wanted to uh, make sure to share it with you. I believe I have before, but it's, it's a very good event. Uh, he will be hosting a job fair uh, and expunge, an expungement, and that's going to be taking place May the 8th uh, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. The location is at the Ontario International Airport Terminal 1. This is the old airport, not the new current one with the airplanes flying in and out, just, just so that we know. Uh, and there is an address of 1940 Moore Way. The, uh, a lot of employers will be there hiring and hopefully a lot on the spot. I was there last year myself. It was very busy. Uh, lots of employers there and lots of uh, people looking for, for jobs. So it was a very good event. Um, let's see. I did want to tell you about the record clearing services. You can meet with uh, the law offices of the public defender and they are there to assist people with starting uh, the process of record clearing. A lot of people, um, they don't know what to do or how to get started, and so it's a very good opportunity. Uh, we do have a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of youth, maybe who had some indiscretions in the past, but they want to move forward, and so we are here to help them on that particular day. So I, you know what, I'm going to show this. Well, maybe you can't see it. We have a little scanner goodie here. Uh, you can always get pre-registered on Eventbrite, and that is, uh, it's, it's a long one. It's wvhv0805.eventbrite.com. So we encourage you to pre-register if you'd like to come. See you there. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Next written request to speak is Mr. Jovan Romero. Good evening, city member, council members. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. And uh, I want to make this short, and I want to thank you uh, for this opportunity. The reason why I'm here is I want to introduce my business, which is an indoor playground. And we are, are called Love to Play in Chino. It's in next to Big Five. It's in Chino Spectrum. It's at 3983 Grand Avenue here in Chino. And it's a 10,000 square foot of playground for children. Um, it's for we cater zero to 12 years old, and we have, basically what we have is a playground, what you see outdoor, and we place it indoor. And we have a cafe, and we have party rooms that we cater for birthday parties. And one of the reasons why I'm here is I'm hoping that the city, if I could get a partnership or collaboration, this is my dream to have a playground, and not just for a business, it's because I, played the, I built this for, for our community, for our children. I was hoping I could have a collaboration with a Chino and take advantage and, and use the resources that we have. We have a 10,000 square foot. And when I was growing up, my parents always introduced me to outreach programs and helping children. And we have this place, and I was hoping that we could use this. I have collab collaborated with some of the organizations before, and we have done um, play date with special children, with special needs, with special abilities. And I have to close my facility 
trust for them and maybe hoping that we can do this all the time. And, and also for the families of underprivileged who can enjoy the place and any programs that the city of Chino have so we could take advantage of the place that I have that we could offer for these children. Ms. Turtle Mayor, I ask that you give your phone number to our assistant city clerk and Linda, maybe you can have staff contact Mr. Romero. Okay. Thank you so much for this opportunity again. God Those bless. are the only written requests to speak I have. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to address any item that is not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the consent calendar. Karen, I understand you want to pull item number four for report? Yes, Mayor. Okay, do any of the council members wish to have any items pulled? Okay, seeing none, then I would entertain a motion and a second for the balance of the consent calendar. We need a second. Okay, we have a motion from Councilman Burton, second from Mayor Pro Time Comstock. Please vote. Balance of the consent calendar passes unanimously. Item number four, staff report from Vivian uh, Castro. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, and members of the audience. For Council consideration this evening is Resolution 24-018, which officially opposes Initiative 21-0042A1 that is qualified for the November 5, 2024 statewide ballot. The initiative, titled the Taxpayer Protection and Government Accountability Act, is backed by the California Business Roundtable and amends the state constitution. Contrary to its title, the initiative would, one, limit voter authority, two, adopt new and stricter rules for raising taxes and fees, and imposing fines and penalties for the violation of state and local laws. It, put bill it puts billions of local government tax and fee revenues at risk. The initiative specifies that taxes adopted after January 1st, 2022, that do not comply with the new rules are void unless Reenacted. For this reason, the League of California Cities, along with a broad coalition of local governments, labor, public safety, education, and infrastructure advocates, strongly oppose this initiative. Staff recommends that the City Council approve Resolution 24-018, opposing Initiative 21-004218A1. This concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Karen, you have comments on this item. Thank you, Mayor. One of my biggest criticisms since I've been involved in law enforcement and just looking at local legislation is the manner in which certain bills or pieces of legislation are titled and summarized. I think sometimes it's meant to be intentionally and purposely confusing to voters. I think sometimes the way voters read the title and summary uh, le lends itself for voters to believe that they're voting for something that really maybe they don't always quite understand. And with this, I think there's no exception to the rule here. I would just like to, uh, Vivian, I think you did a great job explaining that, but just lead, uh, read some speaking points from the League of California Cities since I am actually traveling up there next uh, tomorrow as a member of the board. Um, it's, it is deceptively named the Taxpayer Protection and Government Accountability Act. This is on the November 2024 ballot. And for starters, it's a big attack on local decision-making and local control that puts public services in almost every city at risk in California. Um, again, the, the speaking points go on to talk about not letting the name fool you. Some of the state's biggest corporations under the umbrella of a, of a entity called the California Business Roundtable are sponsoring this measure. And the only thing that it generally protects according to the League of California Cities, as well as almost every city that's in the League has taken an ordinance in opposition to this, is larger corporations trying to avoid paying their fair share of cost owed to cities. The California Business Roundtable measure would significantly re reduce the ability of cities to appropriately raise or collect revenues and fees, including retroactively, and taxes or fees passed since January 1st of 2022. The measure would also create many new opportunities to challenge local revenue measures in the form of litigation, which I think is also some of the most concerning portions of this legislation. If passed, this thoughtless measure will put billions of dollars of vital local government services at risk and cost billions of dollars over many, many years 
of the litigation that's expected to, for this to set off, just to determine really what this means. So, um, as a, as, as a um, you know, as a, as, a, as a city and as a council and as a member of the Cal, Cal Cities, I think it was important for us to take this resolution in support of, uh, of, of the opposition to this measure and also to help educate the taxpayers so they know what they're voting for in November when they go to vote on this in light of how it is titled. So uh, we, uh, we're confident that there is a large um, support mayor and opposition to this up and down the state, but we have to hope that this does not pass because what it would ultimately translate into is simply the deterioration of our vital services that each city provides, not just at the local level, but to courts, you know, to, to, to different counties and different districts that we so desperately need today. So thank you, Mayor, for allowing me to comment on this as, as a member of uh, the Cal Cities Board and a member of this council. And thank you, Ms. Castro, for providing such a good uh, staff report to it. Absolutely. Thank you, Karen, for pulling this off the agenda. Uh, any other comments from council members? Okay, then we would need a motion and a second to approve item number four. Motion from Councilman Flores, second from Mayor Pro Tem Comstock. Please vote. The item passes unanimously. Next on the agenda is item number 14 issuance of bonds for Community Facilities District 2003 03 Improvement Area 10. This is uh, to adopt Resolution 2024-019 for the issuance of bonds for Community Facilities District 2003-03 and approved Bond Council's agreement with Stradling, Yoka, Carlson, and Routh in the amount of $75,000. Staff report this evening will be provided by our Director of Finance, Mr. Rob Burns. Good evening, Mayor and members of City Council. The City of Chino formed CFD 2003-3 Improvement Area 10 in 2022 for the purpose of issuing bonds to pay for infrastructure needed for, to service the properties within the improvement area. These properties in question are located in the preserve. Improvement Area 10 is now ready and eligible to issue bonds. Therefore, tonight we're seeking approval of Resolution 2024-019 authorizing the issuance of special tax bonds of the district and approving the substantially final forms of the preliminary official statement, the fiscal agent agreement, the bond purchase agreement, the continuing disclosure agreement, and the appraisal report. Additionally, we're seeking approval of the bond council agreement in the amount of $75,000. It's anticipated that $20 million in bonds will be sold in May for the purpose of reimbursing the developer for infrastructure related to the various housing projects in the preserve. That concludes my report and I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, any comments from the council? Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the council on this issue? Seeing none, then we would entertain a motion in a second. Motion from Councilman Lucio, second from Mayor Pro Tem Comstock. Please vote. We need the screen to come up. Item passes unanimously. Item number 15, an amendment to the Huit, Huit Zoller's Incorporated Agreement for Design Professional Services, Pine Avenue Extension, and Connection to State Route 71. Approve a Ninth Amendment to the Design Professional Services Agreement, 2015-232, in the amount of $359,730 for a total agreement amount not to exceed $5,292,514.11. Our staff report this evening will be provided by our principal engineer, Michelle Henderson. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. <clears throat> For your consideration this evening is the Ninth Amendment to the Design Professional Services Agreement with Hewitt Zollers, Inc. of Irvine, California, for the Pine Avenue extension and connection to State Route 71 project, uh, project ST061, in the amount of $359,730 for a total revised agreement amount of 
The Pine Avenue extension and connection to State Route 71 project is a major roadway project that will extend Pine Avenue from State Route 71 to the intersection with El Prado Road and will improve the existing roadway between El Prado Road and Euclid Avenue, as shown on the exhibit. The project includes construction of a four-lane urban arterial roadway, a 500-foot bridge across Chino Creek, storm drain and water quality facilities, utility relocation, and grading. The project fulfills the City of Chino's circulation elements objective and will provide relief to the adjacent Battlefield Ranch Road and Central Avenue interchange at State Route 71. On March 15, 2011, the City entered into a professional services agreement with Hewitt Dollars, Inc. for preliminary and final engineering and environmental documentation services. Through the course of 13 years, the city has approved various amendments to expand on the services encumbered under the professional services agreement, as well as extend the agreement terms. The current amendment proposes additional tasks identified as necessary for the orderly completion of the project. Task one will provide additional structural design services in response to the Army Corps of Engineers request for structural analyses and all elements anticipated to be below the Prado Dam inundation pool elevation. Task two will update the phase one environmental site assessment for the project at the request of Caltrans. The original study was performed in February 2019 and Caltrans has deemed an update will be necessary prior to their sign off on the project's environmental documents. Task three expands upon the existing permitting and mitigation services under the professional services agreement. The additional, additional budget allocation will allow the environmental consultant conti to continue with the extended timeline for this effort. Tasks were also added to further, ta sorry, to further satisfy the project's offsite mitigation requirements. Task four includes additional allocation for the consultant's ongoing project administration and coordination with city and various governing agencies. And finally, task five is an, another report update at the request of Caltrans as a result of their environmental document review. Caltrans has requested an update to the project's air quality report utilizing the latest 2024 model. At the city's request, uh, Hewitt Dollars also reviewed the original contract tasks and amendments to identify items that are no longer needed. The unused funds will be reallocated towards the uh, proposed tasks previously mentioned. A total of five tasks were determined to not be necessary um, in order to complete the design, uh, which totaled a $284,270 credit being made available to reallocate. Staff, or, staff therefore recommends the City Council approve amendment number five to the design professional services agreement for city project ST061 in the amount of uh, $359,730 with Hewitt Dollars for a total revised agreement amount of $5,292,514.11. This concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Michelle. Any comments or questions, Karen? Thank you, Michelle. I know we've been working on this project for a very long time, as you stated tonight, 13 years. With the additional revisions to this, how much closer are we to actually advancing this project and um, with the funding and a time frame? What do we, what do we think we're looking at? Can I answer this? Um, yeah. Oh. We, are, we have an ongoing discussion with, obviously, with Army Corps regarding the environmental clearance uh, and the 408 permit, as well as our ongoing uh, partnership with City of Chino Hills. Matter of fact, in the next couple of weeks, City of Chino and City of Chino Hills have a coordination meeting to discuss some of the City of Chino Hills residents' concern for circulation and also traffic 
movement. So we're hoping that as part of these ongoing discussions to clear all the environmental um, work, um, I don't know, in the next two years or so? Yeah, the, um, the goal would be to get the environmental documents uh, signed off through Caltrans. That will get us our NEPA approval. Um, and then the city can therefore take the uh, CEQA adoption to council. Uh, we're expecting that would come um, hopefully by the, the summer, early fall of this year. Um, once we get the CEQA and NEPA adopted, we can therefore um, start the right-of-way acquisition process as well as um, getting the final environmental permits cleared. Um, and as Hagen mentioned, we're working with City of Chino Hills um, to get the, the plans to the final. Okay, I wanna thank our staff. Time is of the essence. I'm sure our taxpayers and residents sitting at home are thinking to themselves that this is not getting any more less expensive to build mm -hmm. as time goes on, number one. Number two, it's been long awaited and overdue for us as a, a critical transportation issue. I was writing letters to support funding for it when I was sitting in, in, in the police department's building trying to uh, circulate emergency services and traffic. And the last thing is, I think time is of the essence on this because we are still in the running for the uh, 2028 Olympic shooting venue. Mm -hmm. And if we want to make sure that that circulation is available and helpful to us, you know, in the coming years, time is, you know, time is of the essence. And I know you know that, but um, I can't think of a better time for us to be very serious about advancing this and getting it under construction so that it can be helpful to us um, when Chino shines as a, hopefully the, the host of, of that Olympic venue. Now that's not a, a done deal, but I, I, I strongly believe that we're in, in good running for that. And this is gonna be essential to our success to, to, to host that uh, venue. So thank you for that. Any other comments or questions? Kutar? Yes, and uh, my only my only comment of that really is, if you guys are meeting with Chino Hills, you know, I'd really like for at least a couple of members of the council to also meet with their city council, to also have a dialogue with them and, and at least have a discussion of why this is important. And it, although it is important to, to bring the Olympic Games, it's also very important to our residents that live down there in the preserve because all their kids go to high school Chino Hills High, and this would make it extremely easier for them to get their kids to and from school constantly. And they wouldn't have to sit around traffic going, you know, different ways to try to get there. It would also ease some traffic congestion that we have that always go on to Euclid Avenue to get onto the 71 freeway, give people an alternative route to get onto the freeway. So this is something that's, that's really important to us as a city, and I think if you guys are meeting with the with the city officials that maybe you guys should include some of their, or at least if we have to reach out to their electeds and see if we can all sit down and have a discussion so that we can move this project forward because I think it's been stalled and stalled and stalled and this is something that we definitely want to move forward. Any other comments? Um, can you put the map back up, please? Um, this obviously will help our circulation, especially as Mark noted, kids going uh, to the school. Uh, but also what's important, and I know our staff is meeting with Supervisor Hagman concerning the Pomona-Rincon road, mm -hmm. uh, getting that improved for traffic circulation going to the shooting range. If we do happen to get the Olympic, um, Olympics here, um, do you know of any progress on that particular road as it deals with Pine Avenue? Because Pine Avenue will um, have to obviously integrate with uh, Pomona Rincon Road. Um, staff has not uh, been uh, connected with the county regarding the Pomona Rincon Road. I believe uh, along that section, part of the road is in the county islands or county uh, right away. So I. I we are fully aware that that area needs to be improved and we will be talking with the county to partner together as we are 
uh, tackling the construction in that area. Okay. Also, that's very important for that whole area with circulation is the Euclid Avenue. And I know mm -hmm. recently we um, awarded a contract for the design of the bridge improvement. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's possible that the improvement of Euclid will also um, coordinate with the improvement of Pine Avenue so that area possibly could totally be improved before the Olympics? That is one of the um, goal. Uh, as a part of the red flag item, I believe I had submitted a preliminary uh, proposed scheduling. Uh, the critical path was environmental clearance. And if environmental clearance can move forward as scheduled uh, without any uh, hiccups, uh, we could potentially complete the construction by uh, the start of the Olympic. OK. Um, have we reached out to our uh, Senate representative on this to help us with Army Corps? Because Army Corps is difficult to deal with. Yes, we are um, city manager and staff have been coordinating with our congressional aide um, to speak with them. And we also met with our consultant to give us a overview of the history on how we got here. And um, just from my understanding, um, hearing the big picture, Army Corps have changed how they used to process 408 permit. 408 permit in, uh, traditionally has been issued for projects that relates to any uh, work uh, within uh, levees or dam when the project actually touches the limits of levees or dam. But since the Houston um, flood in 2017, they have expanded uh, the 408 reach to anything that happens in the floodplain. So I think that's one of the reasons why at one time 408 was not necessary, and then a couple years later, all of a sudden 408 was necessary. I think it was during that time is when Army Corps have switched a uh, little bit of um, uh, on how they want to administer 408 permit. So we're working with our consultants on how to um, communicate this to our partners in the federal government to let them know it's not, we're not touching any of the levees or dams that will be a, a public safety issue for flooding, but this is also a public improvement, not only for our uh, circulatory elements, but also because these areas are prone to flooding that have cost um, actually uh, several lives mm -hmm. in our city. So those are the um, communication elements that we are working on and to share with our congressional aid. You know, another, another issue about that area also is the wildlife, mm -hmm. the fish and game. Um, they periodically throw monkey wrenches into projects because of the breeding season. So mm -hmm. I think we need to be really conscious of that as well and make sure we've done everything that we need to do with fish and game. Yes. Karen? Mary, you should have been in the, in the Zoom meeting with us, uh, with Army Corps and some of our consultants. It was on the day that we were having torrential rain and probably mm -hmm. going to lose Euclid Avenue. We're going through this exemplar. I talk about the loss of life and different things. And um, actually, a couple members from the Army Corps stated that they considered themselves the, the premier agency in issuing these, <laughs> these permits. And I think our staff handled that quite well, actually. And um, we were chose the diplomatic route for this time. But I, I, it, you, know, you can't help but say to yourself, no, just the opposite. It's, it's, it's been the, you know, the, the rock in the funnel for us, you know, proverbially. So I do, I do believe that you know, they have another kernel. And we have a commitment from staff. And of course, now that we have design and different things occurring, I, you know, I would say we're, we're closer than we've ever been you know, to getting that football across the line, but um, it was it was an interesting perspective to hear what they think, you know, on that side of the operation versus what, what we think. So, um, like anything else, but I can assure you that um, um, you know this is a priority for all of us, not just because of everything that the mayor and Mark has said, but circulation, loss of life, preservation of life, and of course um, hosting the venue. So thank you, staff, for all your continued work on this and. I can't wait to, to stand there and, and celebrate with our neighbors in Chino Hill advancing these uh, circulation projects. And most importantly, like Mark said, our residents are going to be so grateful for it. And it's long overdue. Yes. No, and I am hoping that with the Olympics, maybe that will put some extra pressure on them to get them to move, because it's been very frustrating. Yes. 
Okay, with that, we will need a motion and a second pen for item number 15 to move forward. We need a second. We have a motion from Councilman Flores, second from Councilman Lucio. Please vote. Item passes unanimously. Item number 16 has been pulled and sent back to staff. Next item on the agenda is mayor and council reports. Um, I'm going to try to make mine very quick. I've got my detailed notes at home. So uh, Wednesday, April 3rd, I attended the Omnitrans and uh, San Bernardino County Transportation Authority <coughs> Board of Director meetings. Uh, and then that afternoon, I attended um, an event put on by Chick-fil-A where they honor many of their own um, restaurant servers with uh, very, very nice um, scholarships, helping them uh, with their college educations. Thursday, April 4th, I attended the Ag meeting that we have here at City Hall. That afternoon, I attended the Chino de Saltra Authority Board of Director and uh, Inland Empire Utilities Agency Sewerage Policy Committee. Um, that was a little bit of a contentious meeting as their future now, they're looking at a billion dollars worth of projects in the next 10 years. It's going to have to be funded by the rate players as well as uh, they're trying to get some grants and things. So it's, it's a staggering number. Um, and those of us that are on the committee are not entirely convinced that all of those projects are absolutely needed right now. Uh, so that's going to be an ongoing discussion. But a billion dollars of projects in the next 10 years, I, our portion of it would be staggering. Friday, April 5th, I attended the senior birthdays. Saturday, April 6th was Healthy Family Day and Bark Around Ayala Park, and I took Blazer to it. Um, we lost one of our Dalmatians last year, and so Blazer's all by himself, and one of the booths had a blow-up Dalmatian that was the size of a real dog. He saw it at a distance and got so excited. Wanted to go over to it. Of course, when he sniffed it, it was a blow-up dog, and he was, you could just see him kind of go, oh, it was sad. Time for a new dog, man. I know. Well, I'm trying to convince Bob we need a, <laughs> we need an additional dog. He's not going for it so far. <laughs> um, but it was a really, really nice event, very, very nicely attended, and the weather was nice. And Mark was there. You brought your dog. He has this huge dog. What kind is it? A bulldog? It's a... Mix between a pit bull and a, and a bulldog, but it's like that long and that wide, and its legs are that long. Um, <laughs> it's like a little tank. Uh, let's see. Tuesday, I had my meeting with Linda, our city manager, and then attended the workshop that evening with the rest of the council on possibly televising our commissions in the future. Wednesday, April 10th, I attended the mayor's prayer breakfast, which was nicely attended. Uh, Thursday, April 11th, Omnitrans Admin and Finance Committee, SBCTA Transit Committee, and Metro Valley Committee meeting. Friday was my birthday. We didn't do a whole lot, but we went out to dinner that evening with Troy and his family, so that was nice. Saturday, April 13th, um, was the Chino Valley Youth Track Meet. There were 785 kids involved, and they're all um, elementary kids. So that was, that was a very nice event. Staff did an excellent job. And it was a combination of our staff and Chino Hills, some of Chino Hills staff. Tuesday, today I attended uh, a one-on-one -on -one with Linda and then also did my video chat with Jan Perkins, who's our consultant that we're speaking to uh, about our goal setting workshop. Okay. Councilman Burton. No, I'm sorry. Mayor Pro Tem Comstock, you have item number 17. I do, Mayor. I would like to ask for the council support and these community support funds for public safety, some service clubs, um, uh, local charitable organizations within the city of Chino that have been listed here that have been approved and vetted by our staff. So having said that, um, thank you, Mayor. I'd like to ask for the support from the council on those items. Need a motion and a second. Hmm. 
Motion from Councilman Burton, second from myself. Please vote. Item passes unanimously. Balance of your report. Thank you, Mayor. I'm gonna forego my um, report tonight to talk about several of us traveling to Sacramento tomorrow. Of uh, particular interest to us, and Mayor, I wanna thank you for the press release and the, the comments that you were prepared for. The transportation of prisoners from San Quentin Institution to the California Institute for Men. I consider this a serious public safety issue. It's not a surprise for anybody in this community to understand that the California Institute for Men is an ongoing and deteriorating uh, correctional facility. And this is of no disregard to any of the correctional officers that work at, at the California Institute for Men. They do the best job that they can down there given the set of circumstances. This is one of the state's original institutions and it is poorly equipped to house um, some of the most serious death row offenders that are now being transported out of San Quentin and some of them down here into uh, CIM. Uh, there is its own state auditor report, which I'm sure the chief and council member Lucio will also touch on, requiring the institution to invest approximately 26 to $30 million annually per year to maintain its current poor operational state. And in fact, that audit called for if those funds were not dedicated to the California Institute for Men, and at one point, the institution probably would need to be condemned itself. So inmates that are housed at this facility or any facility have a lot of time and understand the operations or the security operations on any given yard. They know when certain things fail, they know when things go out. And our last escape or attempted escape, well, it was an escape in, I wanna say it was 2018, the inmate that was being housed there knew of a, of a particular perimeter and shaker fence that was not operating, hadn't been operating for months, the institution was aware of it, and just didn't have the funding they claimed at the time to correct it. When that inmate decided he needed to escape from the institution, that was exactly where he went and found his way off, off of those premises, and he escaped into, via a car from a, from a local security agent into the city of Chino Hills where he eventually was able to leave the community. You may ask yourself, hey, Mayor Pro Tem, why do you think this is important? Well, the state can virtually do what they want with their property. They've proven that to us time and time again. Number one, it's important because they're not transparent with us when they do it. We found out about it in a series of meetings after it had already been done. But the other thing is, make no mistake about it, as CIM continues to deteriorate, when they have problems down there in the form of a riot or an escape or a potential escape, the Chino Police Department as well as other emergency responders is the entity that will be responsible, right, for apprehending and ensuring local public safety during one of those critical incidents. I know, because I've worked them. And fortunately for us, we have a great public safety component in line. But the fact of the matter is, I don't appreciate the state doing this without being more straightforward with us. I also don't believe that the California Institute for Men is suitable for these, this level of inmates to go into a facility that is in such dire need of improvements, as well as it's going to impact our community when they transport them, which I'm sure uh, will be commented on here in a few minutes, but as well as when they need local medical care into our local medical facilities. So there's a lot of moving parts here, but that's one of the things we are going to be hopefully addressing with the help of some of our local public officials, with the Department of Corrections and the Secretary of Corrections, as well as meeting with some of our other local officials and our senator um, about other legislation that affects us, affects us here at the local level. So I'm looking forward to traveling up there, not just for the city leaders summit, but I know there's been can be several of us me meeting with our legislators up there and just doing our best to, to uh, have your voices heard up there and advocating for local control and certainly holding the California Institute for Men to, to perform their jobs and, and, and do their jobs more diligently. So thank you, Mayor. You're welcome, Karen. Councilman Burton. Thank you, Mayor. On the fifth, I attended the, the Chamber of Commerce Leadership Collaborative. On the sixth, the Healthy Family Day at Ayala Park, uh, along with uh, Council Member Lucio and the Mayor. Uh, Chris, were you there with your dog? Bark around the park? Oh, my dog's in heat right now, so oh. she's sheltered. Okay, then. <laughs> <laughs> I also met with a business owner here in the city, and then uh, to conclude the evening of the 6th, uh, the mayor, council member uh, Flores, and Mayor Pro Tem and I, we attended the Centennial Celebration Gala 
at the American Legion Post 299, celebrating Elmer C. Jertberg as the uh, original member and the person who started the the uh, American Legion here. It was an outstanding event, and we really uh, were just honored to be there in the presence of those folks. On the 9th, I attended a water meeting, uh, followed by a housing meeting with staff, and then the council workshop. On the 10th, the mayor's prayer breakfast. On the 11th, I attended the Chino Basin Water Master meeting with our, our uh, department director, uh, Agent Lee. On the 12th, the retail theft roundtable at the Chino Police Department with Chief Menson and Assembly Member Rodriguez. On the 13th, I attended the residential cleanup that was being held here in town, where you can go and take your old tires and television electronics. Uh, that was being hosted by Waste Management and also the city. It was incredible, just the dynamics down there. There were a ton of cars when I got there. I thought, this is going to take forever. It was seamless, folks. Uh, our staff was down there, and they just really did a great job. Agent, just great job from your staff. I appreciated it. Uh, and then after that, I attended the grand opening with Council Member uh, Flores of Pet Wants which is kind of a, a pet boutique. They have dog food there, uh, all the types of things that you need for your pets. Uh, they don't sell pets there, uh, but uh, go down and see Mary Jane there. Uh, it's at the State of Brothers Shopping Center at Schaefer and Euclid. Brand new business. It uh, looks like it's gonna be uh, real successful. And then I had my weekly meeting with the city manager today, uh, and that uh, wrapped everything up. I will also be attending uh, the uh, legislative uh, days up in Sacramento with the mayor pro tem, also uh, council member uh, uh, Flores and I will be there. Folks, it's just a shame what the state of California is trying to do to us. And it just goes on and on and on. It's the leadership up in Sacramento and they don't care <coughs> about local government. They're gonna do what they're gonna do and they're showing that to us right now. And even the perfect example is this, uh, the transfer of all these death row inmates down to, to Chino Prison. Uh, it's a shame we're gonna go up there, we're gonna represent our city, uh, as well as the city of Chino Hills, reps will be there. Uh, but I'll tell you what, uh, get involved, pay attention to what's going on in our community. We really need your support. And Mayor, that's all I have. Thank you, Thank you Kurt. Councilman Flores, you have item number 18. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm asking for approval for a community support fund contribution of $500 to the Chino Valley Chamber Foundation Leadership Project supporting the Chino Community Children's Theater and $500 to Trail Life Troop 2678. Okay, we need a motion and a second for item number 18. Motion from Mayor Pro Tem Comstock. You switched it too quick. Who was the second? I was. Uh, second from Councilman Lucio. Please vote. Item passes unanimously. Rest of your report, please. Yes, thank you, Mayor. On the 6th of April, I attended the Centennial Celebration Gala 2024 for the uh, Post 299 American Legion. On the 8th, I attended the Seroptimus uh, Spaghetti Dinner and Bingo. Um, that was such a fun event. On the 9th of April, I had a chance to partner with Food for Life and um, get some things in, um, with them in terms of um, food and distribution. That same day, um, I had a, a special needs collaboration event uh, meeting with uh, some of our staff here. I'm definitely looking forward to that event. Um, that same day, I attended the council workshop here um, in the council chambers. On the 10th, I attended the mayor's prayer breakfast and also met with a local business owner and property owner and um, some of our staff members as well to talk about some issues that um, one of their neighbor businesses is having. On the 12th of April, I attended the retail theft roundtable over at the Chino Police Department, as mentioned already. And on the 13th, um, I attended the youth track and field meet over at Chino High School and also attended the grand opening of Pet Wants um, and one unique thing about Pet Wants is uh, they're the first um, business in town that we know of and probably in the region that has their own um, pet washing station. 
Um, so you can take your dog there, and there's a, a big private room where you can wash your dog, and um, you can draw your dog um, fairly quickly, even if you have a pretty big dog. So that's pretty cool. And they deliver as well, and they deliver food. Um, and today I had a meeting with our consultant uh, for a workshop coming up um, with Jan Perkins, and Mayor, that concludes my comments. Okay, thank you. Councilman Lucio. Yes. On the 6th, I attended a Healthy Chino Day with my family and my dog. On, uh, on the 9th, I attended the CIM, CIW Citizens Advisory <laughs> Committee meeting. Um, at that meeting, uh, just to touch on a little bit, uh, for the folks that aren't familiar with it, so there was a resolution or a proposition passed in 2016 called Proposition 66. And in that measure, like a lot of the measures that are passed, uh, the true intention isn't shown to the voters. So in there, they, they sold it as a measure that was going to limit the amount of time that a death row inmate had to appeal their case. So the majority of the public agreed that it shouldn't be drawn out for 20, 30 years with constant appeals. Um, they also said that a death row inmate should be responsible for restitution to the victims of the families that they committed these crimes. So most people voted that that was something that should be done. What people didn't realize was death row inmates don't work in prison because they're segregated, they're isolated one man cells because a lot of these people are the worst of the worst. These are people that have nothing to lose. They, uh, they're sentenced to the highest crime that you, you know, highest sentence you can sentence a person to, which is death. And a lot of these people don't just have one murder they committed, they've committed multiple murders. So once an inmate is condemned to death, even in the county jail system, they immediately get segregated, they get put in high power, they're waist chained and handcuffed everywhere they go, and they put in single man cells. And when they get to state prison, they're also, the same thing occurs, they're, they're placed in death row, single man cells, with even mesh in front of their bars so they can't stab or spear anybody as they're walking by. Well, when this measure passed, the legislation then said, well, in order for these individuals to pay back restitution, they have to be moved into a facility where they can program, have a job and work and be able to do this. So the way the state system has now indicated why they're housing them in, and when you look at the state system, you have level ones to level four yards, level four being the highest with the most violent that they have in state prison, aside from segregation and and high, you know, and then there are other special housing units that they have. So these inmates are being housed in level two yards, which is for kind of a, a lower level inmate. And the reason that they're saying this is because they said that they haven't had enough points that they've accumulated while in the prison system because they've been isolated. So the way you get points is assaults, assaults on staff, different things that you're not doing. So your points get accumulated and that's how you get moved into different yards. But when you're segregated for 20 years and you can't assault anybody, you can't stab anybody, you can't do anything because you're segregated because of the level of security that you require, your points are gonna be low because you don't have opportunity. So because they didn't have opportunity to do this, the state of California says that they can be put in a lower level prison. So these inmates that were once now segregated are now gonna be walking among themselves. And we currently have 24 housed in the California Institution for Men in a level two yard. And they say the only reason that they can house them there is because they have an electrified fence. And like they've, they've spoken to it earlier, the conditions at, at CIM are not the optimal conditions that you want to be able to house these types of individuals. These individuals, even though they're trying to put them in a general population setting, should be in a level four yard. They should not be housed in a level two yard with other inmates. If you were to get four or five of these individuals that decided, hey, we're gonna break out, because again, there's nothing you can do to these individuals that hasn't already been sentenced upon them. They can try to escape, and the worst thing you can do is just put them in a maybe a higher level yard. You can't give them any more time. They've already been sentenced to death. So to put this many individuals in one yard in an open compound is, is reckless and dangerous. And especially in a facility like this in Chino that requires so much maintenance to bring it up to the security level that's required. And not only that, but 
when you go to transfer these inmates, and a lot of these inmates will say that they're sick or injured or what have you, and you have to go have them treated, you're gonna have to take them to a local hospital. And a lot of these inmates that are sentenced to death row, the majority of people come from LA County. We're a rock throw away from LA County. So to think that these individuals can't cooperate with people on the outside to see if maybe they can try to break them out, this is, this, this is a major safety concern that we should all be upset about. Because even though we meet with them regularly, we didn't find out about this until we met with them on Tuesday, and by then we already had 15 of them housed here with another eight coming or nine coming that, that weekend. So now we're up to 24. So this is something that you know, we've, we talked to our, our local cities. Chino Hills is on board. Obviously, we all know what happened in Chino Hills when, when we had an escape with Kevin Cooper. Ontario is also on board. Uh, our, our, our supervisor is on board. We've been talking to our state assemblymen. And we're just hoping to be able to get some of these meetings going and, and start bringing to light some of the things that they're going to be causing us as a result of moving these type of inmates into our area. This is not... This is not something that we should really think it's not a big deal. This is a big deal. Uh, these people should never be housed in this type of facility, and they should definitely not be in an open compound. Um, but based on all the time I've taken, I'm, uh, I'll forego the rest of my report. Uh, I have nothing further. Thank you. And, and Mark, I'd like to add that that type of coordination in the hospital for escape or the, the transportation of contraband in our local hospital has already occurred and happened in the past which is why it's so concerning. So thank you for, for updating us on that. You know, both uh, Mayor Pro Tem and uh, Comstock and Councilman Lucio mentioned a study that was done. That study was done in 2008, and it said, again, you know, millions of dollars needed to be spent yearly in order to bring this prison up to acceptable standards. And if they didn't do it, the report said by 2014, the prison should be shut down should be condemned. Well, they haven't done it, and we're 10 years past when the prison should have been decommissioned and shut down. And now we're housing the worst of the worst. I was talking to Linda today, and she actually has a, a brief list of the types of offenders these people are that are within our prison, and it's it's frightening. Linda, do you have that handy? I, I didn't bring it down here with me. You haven't? Because I'd like the public to know just how dangerous these people are. and like. Like Mark said, they're now going to be in a level two yard when they should be in a level four because of the, the um, law that was passed years ago. Um, here's, here, I'm not going to give you names, but That's here's, a a this is a partial list of, of the people that, are, that have already been transported to our prison. One, serial rapist who murdered one of his rape victims in Orange County, 2013. Number two, stabbed his girlfriend to death and murdered his cellmate. Crime occurred in Riverside County, 2019. Number three, white supremacist gang member with a, a double murderer. Killed fellow gang members, one with a gun and one with a claw hammer. Another one, killed a victim with an ax during a home invasion robbery in Ventura County. Another one, beat and tortured a woman to death in Delano. Another, double murder of two teenagers working at a Subway sandwich shop in LA County. Uh, another one, kidnap, rape, and murder of an 11-year-old girl in L.A. County. Number eight, double murder during a drug ripoff in Pomona. Number nine, partners with Chauncey Vesley in a double murder in Pomona. Number 10, arsonist responsible for Esperanza that killed five firefighters in Cabazon. Number 11, convicted in a murder for hire in Orange County involving gangs. Number 12, convicted for rape and murder, double murder in Riverside County during a kidnap and robbery. Number 13, beat his ex-girlfriend then lit her on fire in front of her children. Number 14, convicted of kidnapping, raping, and murdering a 14-year-old girl in Chula Vista. These are the kind of people that are in our prison right now. Right now. Right now. And if they get transported to Chino Community Hospital, there is a possibility that they could escape. This is serious, folks. This is really <coughs> serious. And, and we can't change the law. They're going to do what they're going to do. But the least that we can do is put enough pressure on the state of California to fix that prison to ensure these people can't get out. And it's, again, like Karen had said, too, with a lot of our laws, we pass laws, we vote on things that we really don't know what they contain, which is a shame, a shame that we're tricked, so to speak. 
Uh, city manager, your report. Thank you, Mayor. I don't have a report tonight, but our Public Works Director, Hey Jin, would like to introduce our new city engineer. Okay. I'm one, I am actually very delighted, even after all these um, <laughs> terrible news about what's going on in our CIM, but I, I am really honored to introduce Albert Espinoza, our new city engineer. He comes to us from city of Brea. Uh, even at the expense, expense of my own, own city that I live in, I scouted him here to come and work with us here. Um, he has excellent reputation among the peers, not only um, in Orange County, but also in the Inland Empire area. And he is also a resident of City of Chino. So I, we are doubly excited the fact that whatever he does here, he's investing back into the community. But I want him to come and introduce himself a little bit so um, all of you guys could also get to know him. Great, okay. Albert? Well, thank you for the introduction, Hayden, and good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Albert Espinoza. And I've been here with the city uh, for 21 years. My wife and I moved here after we graduated from Cal Poly Pomona. And I'm very invested in this community. I do spend a lot of time uh, doing 5Ks. That's when I had the opportunity to meet the chief at the Run for Us when I meddled in my age group. <laughs> I take great pride in that. And typically, uh, some of the things I do to give back to the community, you'll typically see me Friday afternoons once ASO starts. I, I'm a volunteer referee. My kids already aged out a couple years ago, but they still call me back to uh, give back to the community. And I'm very blessed to be here in my hometown where I, now I live, work, and play. And great team. I'm very excited to work with Hey Jin and the community and, and give, you know, be part of it and give back to my, uh, my town. And a uh, little bit more about myself. I am a civil engineer. I'm both a licensed civil and traffic engineer. So I'll be able to help Dennis Rawls with that a lot, hopefully, especially with some of the traffic uh, concerns that we have throughout our community. And I also have a master's in public administration from Cal Baptist University. So very blessed and fortunate to be here this evening. And thank you for your time. Well, welcome home, Albert. Thank you. Thank you for what being here. What part of Chino? Yeah. What part of Chino, Albert? Uh, I live off of uh, Philadelphia and Norton. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Galante. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. <clears throat> I thought I would take this opportunity to talk about a case that mm -hmm. was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court on Friday of last week because it is actually the most significant case addressing uh, city-imposed fees in literally the last 30 years. Uh, the case is Sheets versus County of El Dorado. We had been anticipating this decision. Um, until this case was decided, the legal standards were different for fees adopted by public agencies through what's called the legislative process. So, for example, adoption through an ordinance of development impact fees versus what's called the ad hoc process where an applicant comes up and uh, on the spot there is a decision uh, to uh, create a fee. Sir, can you please mute your phone? Go ahead. Um, so the courts imposed a more rigorous standard to, upon ad hoc, it, so basically uh, fees adopted administratively. Um, on the theory that those are potentially subject to abuse by public agencies against particular applicants or projects. The plaintiff, George Sheets, challenged a $25,000 traffic impact fee imposed by El Dorado County as a legislative fee applicable to a housing project. So obviously he believed that was pretty significant. Uh, the trial court upheld the fee, but the matter was ultimately appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the public agencies are allowed to charge fees as conditions of development, um, what are called ad hoc fees, so long as they follow what had been the line of cases up, in, up until 1994, which, um, which are called the Nolan versus California Coastal Commission and Dolan versus City of Tagard, uh, which the last case was decided in 1994. Those cases, known as the Nolan-Dolan standard, require that ad hoc fees pass a more rigorous standard. They have to be both um, reasonably related 
to um, the particular impact that they're, they're uh, trying to address, as well as r roughly proportional. So whatever charge is being imposed has to be proportional to the amount. So those are the two tests. And that test was not applicable on legislatively adopted fees. Um, for those, it was only the, a reasonable relationship. You, the, the city just had to come up with this reasonable analysis that said um, it's reasonably related. So last Friday, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Mr. Sheets, which uh, essentially brings both of those processes in alignment. They have to now undergo that same more rigorous standard. And uh, the quote from Justice Amy Coney Barrett said, uh, provided that there is no basis for affording property rights less protection in the hands of legislators than administrators. The takings clause applies equally to both, which means that it prohibits legislatures and agencies alike from imposing unconstitutional conditions on land use permits. So there's obviously been a lot of dialogue amongst uh, legal counsel about this case. My take on it, actually after reading the case, is that although this could be a precursor to maybe a more rigorous process to come, I don't think it has as significant of an impact as was initially feared. For example, I don't believe it will nev negatively impact the uh, fees that the city has adopted, the development impact fees. And I say that because you have always uh, required a nexus study mm -hmm. that I believe has already done a lot of this analysis. So obviously we'll take a look at any future study to make sure it comports with the standards. but. Um, my take is it probably doesn't have as earth-shattering of an effect as uh, I've read some attorneys uh, address. So I just thought I would report on that since it's pretty significant in this area of law. Okay. But our staff will be reviewing your recommendations and making sure we're compliant. Certainly. I do take a look at the Nexus studies when they're perf performed and uh, provide comments, but obviously we'll do that in light of this case. Yeah. Again, please give it another look under the new ruling now. And for it, I think, uh, you know, based off the, it's interesting that this is the case that ended up in front of the Supreme Court. When you look at the merits of the case, I don't, I completely understand why the court opined in this. I think some of the reach there was a pretty egregious, actually, to this landowner. So I'm not surprised, but um, um, it's just an example when there's other entities that aren't doing other things right that all of us have to pay for it and make sure that we're doing things that are proper and lawful. So I'm actually happy they issued that opinion for, for this particular person and other entities that may choose to be doing things that I think are not, pro you know, not fair. And I think that's a very insightful comment because some of the comments have been that this was a manufactured home, a $25,000 impact fee for someone who was retiring with his wife and uh, moved to this more rural area to develop this manu, you know, um, establish this manufactured home, and all of a sudden he gets this bill for twenty five thousand dollars for that one seemed, on one home. Yeah. Huh? Yes. So that oh does gosh. seem like the Supreme Court justices probably found that to be offensive. Chief me Christmas, Chief Minson. Thank you, Mayor. So obviously, as the chief, my number one responsibility is safety to our community. And getting this information last week was, was very concerning. Our team has been working very hard this past week and researching this and getting as much information as we possibly can. Today, we had a meeting, had a meeting with the warden, his executive team, uh, Captain Gerard, the chief of Chino Hills, um, the deputy chief from Ontario, uh, a couple of deputy chiefs from the fire department, and where we got more information from, from the warden. Currently, there is now 26 condemned inmates at being housed at, at CIM. Um, there is another 400 inmates that still have to be moved out of um, San Quentin. And not, not, no, we don't know where they, they couldn't provide us a number of how many uh, the CIM is gonna get, but there's an additional 400 that still need to be moved out. So. Um, we got some more specifics on the actual operation, and we are, we've implemented some immediate security procedures at, at, our, at the police department, some we are working with the warden, um, so because obviously our, our responsibility is the safety to our community and, and having these inmates that are there right now. So 
I have some of those same concerns. Obviously, I, I think we're reliving everything we went through in 2016, 2017 and dealing with the mental health facility, the 50 bed mental health facility that is coming and is supposed to be open in December of 2025. Um, so that's just gonna add to things that are taking place there on, on the prison. Um, I do have a good working relationship with the warden. Um, obviously this stuff is being, it's, it's not his doing, it's being carried down from above him and being, it's being given the direction. Um, so he's, he's assisting with us with, with these procedures that we're, that we're implementing and putting in place. Kevin, he has to be concerned as well, right? I mean, he knows the condition of the prison he's in charge of. Yeah, I think uh, obviously he has a boss that has a boss, and I think he's very cautious on what he's what he what he can say and what he can tell us. Of course. Um, and he obviously can't be give his personal opinion, but right. um, we talk more less opinion and more on um, operationally because we had a lot of questions operationally how things were were taking place in there. I'm sure he's got a lot of concerns about his personnel. Because uh, yeah. again, the, these guys have nothing to lose, so assaulting or injuring staff there would not be anything that these guys wouldn't be. These guys would do that and know that they, there's nothing more they can do to them. So I'm sure he's got a lot of uh, concern for the people that work there as well. I'm sure. Well, and if if they have a mini riot breakout like we did several years ago, fire department had to respond because it was a fire there and. With this kind of inmate, who knows what could happen? Yeah, the biggest thing with the fire department is the uh, um, is the medical assistance, and off, and that's that was a that was a concern that I know Chief Williams and, and his team have. Um, so there's there's still, again, we didn't know about this until last Tuesday, so we had no time to like this was coming, and now we're we're a little bit behind the game, um, but these inmates are there right now, and so we have to we have to put things in place immediately to make sure. Uh, safety of our community so and we've done that thank you very much appreciate it yes Karen uh, chief I know you're going with us to Sacramento tomorrow so thank you for traveling with us but I just uh, would like to ask that you make sure that I mean I'm sure it's been a long time since they looked at their escape protocols I actually conducted a a, a tabletop and an exercise drill so I know we're in good hands with you down there making sure that they're also not that we're not just doing our part to update the MOU with them and operational response, but they're also doing their part, that we're holding them accountable to do their part. There's tons of correctional officers that have transferred in and out of that yard. We're all familiar that it's because of its design and its original intention was to be the prison with no walls. It is one of the most difficult institutions to secure, right, during one of those operations. So if you would just make sure that we're doing our best to hold them accountable to properly train their personnel in the event of one of these incidents with these, with these inmates, we would appreciate it. Absolutely, and it, I mean, you bring it up and this was discussed is the way CIM is built and they talked about this electric fence and that's the reason why we're getting these inmates is because they have an electric fence all the other prisons have an electric fence entire around the entire prison but because this prison is spread out it's only around this one yard where this is being housed so it's you know being being the third oldest prison it was built in 1941 um, it has its, it has its challenges and Going down the list, it has the third, we're currently right now today, has the third most condemned inmates that are being housed there compared to the others in the state. Chief, to, to piggyback on the mayor pro tem, uh, as far as protocol and policies, does CIM, are they still required in the event of, an, of a miscount or an escape to sound their uh, siren? Uh, when that when that occurs there is they have the siren they test it every Friday at 12 o'clock and there is protocols on when that siren is is activated uh, we also have our our ability to do it we've done it a little bit with the it's been a while we had the 2018 escape and that's our last one um, and technology has advanced a little bit but we've had walkaways from the fire camp and it's completely separate from CIM but our community doesn't understand the difference they think it's an escape from CIM and so we have some things in place Chino notify Obviously, our social media, we have a, a significant reach with social media, so, and then they have the, the alarm as well. And if they have a miscount down there, what, what, what's their procedure if you know? Do they immediately notify our police department in the event of a miscount? Uh, or what, what's our protocol? They immediately notify us of a miscount. We immediately start dispatching units to the area, and then they go through another count. It's either a miscount or if they get a, a call from a passerby that says they might have saw an inmate walking along the side, 
immediately they call us, we dispatch our available units down there, they do an another count, and then obviously it escalates from there. Chief, but, but looking back at the 2018 escape, they never sounded that alarm. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, 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 I don't I remember. I can tell you living there, dinner. I've never heard the alarm sound other than the first Friday of every month when they test it. Mm -hmm. But they've had escapes from there, and I've never heard them sound that alarm ever. So, or turn on the little red light that's supposed to be on top of the water tower. They've never activated any of those procedures whenever they've had an escape since I've been living there since 2003. So, I mean, you really need to come down on those guys and tell them if they, if they have an escape, they need to start sounding the alarm, especially with the level of people we have in there. And that will be, we, we talked about it today. We're going to have a follow-up meeting with them um, probably next week to go over now that we have the information we have the opportunity to, uh, to put in place. We'll, we'll talk about that alarm. Um, I think now, you know, today I got, I got the warden cell phone number. Um, so having that and being able to, to call him, I think one of the delays of getting this meeting, quite frankly, we would have liked to have had this meeting last week was he was, he was out of the country. Um, so that was the delay of, of it being a week to get this meeting set up today. Um, but yeah, those are all things. I mean, obviously we have all of our, our practices are in place. We have our procedures and they're definitive, but they're only as good as what CIM does and then the notification and obviously Mayor Pro Tem, I mean, going through this, you being the chief of the, the last escape and the, the challenge we had back then. I understand the chief that's there, or chief, the warden that's there now is permanent instead of just the rotation that we've been through for many years. So hopefully we'll get a lot better relationship established with him and his staff since he's going to be there for a while. Yeah, I will say War, Warren P Pennington is, um, you know, I've, I've been here for, for quite some time. This is, I mean, I've, he is, he's, he's personable, he, he's committed. Um, you can tell he's not happy about this, obviously. I mean, he's really um, wanting to, to have the relationship with, with both the police department, the city, the fire department. Um, so he still has the interim title. Um, it's been, a, I don't know what their process is. It's been approved by the governor, but it hasn't been solidified, but he is going to be the permanent warden. Well, and he's been he's been in the Chino area for some time. That's good for us, though. Very good. I mean, he's already been participating in our community, which is unusual. So, and he values that. I think actually he wants to set up a meeting with you specifically. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Chief Williams. Good evening, Mayor. Not to belabor the conversation, but. Um, you know, there is the, always the threat of the, the escape piece, but we're also concerned about the threat of the inside piece as we respond in there for the different needs that we have to go take care of in there. So, um, you know, the fact that those folks are co-mingled is a bit concerning for the fire department as well. So uh, the fire district does stand ready. We are engaged and will support of the law enforcement uh, component wherever, wherever we can. So just be mindful of that. Uh, moving on, uh, I just wanted to, uh, make you aware that we have uh, finally uh, closed our application for our qualified bidder process related to our new fire station. So we're on to the next steps there. So again, that will help add another layer of service to to the city here. Um, I wanted the community to, as they fly by, as they drive by our fire stations and they see an additional flag on our flagpole, it's our Donate for Life flag. Uh, so we are supporters of um, organ, the organ donating uh, donor um, program. And uh, I wanted to inform you that I'll, next week I'll be at uh, Fire District Association of California speaking uh, specifically related to um, how to secure funding for community projects. You know, we were successful in this last go around and, and so we've been sought out to, to be able to speak to other communities and, and um, uh, uh, community organizations about how to secure that for their, their uh, processes. And I think that's all I have unless you have any questions. Quick question about the transition from AMR. How is that going? Uh, so far, it's going well. We're still on track to take over services October 1st. Uh, there was a, uh, you know, AMR did file a lawsuit that was supposed to be heard uh, this coming, the April 18th. Uh, that has been pushed back. I didn't, I have not received any new dates. Um, so as, as far as we're concerned, we've been given a direction from uh, the County Board of Supervisors to continue forth as uh, we're taking over on October 1st. Um, we're working through some of the little internal details and putting all the logistical pieces in place, um, but it's going forward and um, we're, we're still looking forward to it. Good, good. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions of David? Okay, thank you very much. 
Okay, that's all the business we have this evening. So we're going to adjourn. Our next regular meeting will be held on May 7th, Tuesday at 6 o'clock. Unless we need closed session, that will start no earlier than 4 o'clock. So with that, we are adjourned.